MBK 1 37 the chorus attack the Rada chapter 37 the chorus attack the Rada the news of Kichika's death spread from country to country everyone was amazed to hear of his mysterious killing and the subsequent death of his 100 followers in Hastinapura, the spies dispatched by Doryodhan came to the court and reported everything they had seen and heard. After informing the Khorus that they had found no trace of the Pandavas, they then told them about Kichika's death. The Khorus were joyful to hear this news. Kichika had been a thorn in their side, often attacking surrounding countries and defeating their armies. Many times the Khorus had been approached by tributary kings seeking protection from Kichika. Now he and his generals were dead, apparently killed by invisible Gandharavas. Doryodhan pondered the news. Less than two weeks remained of the Pandavas exile. Although he had sent out thousands of spies, none had managed to find them. The Pandavas had hidden themselves well, if they were even alive. The prince summoned his courtiers and said, you should arrange for one final search for the Pandavas. Have the best of our men scour every city and town. If those heroes still live, we face great danger. We are expecting them to emerge from exile surrounded by their forces. Let us discover them before this happens and send them back to the forest, Dashashana agreed. We should certainly make a great effort to locate the Pandavas, but I doubt we will find them. We have already searched every city in town. Either they have perished or they have crossed the ocean. I think they are gone forever. I do not think we need fear them. When Dashashana sat down, Drona stood up and said, Persons like the Pandavas never meet destruction. They are heroic, resourceful, intelligent, self-controlled, pious, grateful, and attached to observing vows. Yudhishthira is both virtuous and without enemies. He is their leader. Thus they are patiently waiting the day when they can return and overcome their misfortunes. This is my opinion. O Doryodhan, you will see the Pandavas at the end of their exile and not before. Do not waste your energy searching for them. Rather, you should prepare a welcome for them. Give them back their kingdom." Bhishma applauded Drona's speech. The Karu grandfather longed to again see Pandu's sons. Their exile had passed slowly for him. His guilt at not having prevented Doryodhan from banishing them burned him day and night. The pain of remembering how Draupadi had been violated was especially acute. Bhishma felt helpless. Dhritarashtra did not heed his advice and the evil-minded Doryodhan was left to do as he pleased. Now the Pandavas would finally be returning. Surely they had suffered enough. Perhaps the king could now be convinced to return to them their kingdom. Like the full moon rising in the east, Bhishma, clad in white silks, rose from his seat to address the assembly. I fully agree with Drona. The virtuous Pandavas, guided by the Brahmins and walking always on a righteous path, will not perish. They who have as a friend the infallible and all-powerful Krishna cannot be overcome by misfortune. The pure soul Yudhishthira can consume his enemies with his glance alone. We should consider carefully how to deal with them now that their exile is ending. It is certainly a mean policy to search for them. I have another view. Listen carefully and I will speak for our good. A counselor should always speak the beneficial truth and never anything evil. Bhishma looked around the Karu assembly hall. At its head sat Dhritarashtra, flanked by Bidura, Drona, Kripla, Balika, and himself Doryodhan and his brothers sat to the king's right, along with Karnav and Chakuni. Other kings sat in the assembly and all gazed intently at him as he spoke. Although it was well known that he loved the Pandavas dearly, the assembled kings knew he would never be partial. His first thoughts were for the welfare of the entire Karu race, and he dealt equally with everyone, desiring nothing but their good fortune. Placing his hand on his golden-hilted sword, Bhishma continued. As far as locating the Pandavas is concerned, I will tell you where to find them. Look for that place where there are no calamities or disasters. Where the pious Yudhishthira dwells, there will be an atmosphere of peace and security. The people will be inclined toward charity and will be liberal, humble and modest. There the people will be cheerfully performing their respective duties, attached to piety, truthfulness and purity. You will hear the Vedic hymns being chanted and see sacrifices being performed. Clouds will shower abundant rains and the earth will be bearing crops. There will be signs of wealth everywhere, and no one will be miserable. Indeed, that place where you'd hish their lives will resemble the heavens. Knowing all this, O Korus, consider what should be done. 
In my view, we should give up our petty attempts to fund them just to send them again to the forest. Let us welcome them back and restore to them their father's kingdom. Bhishma sat down, applauded by Drona, Vidura and Kripla, who himself rose from his seat and said, What the aged Bhishma has said is undoubtedly correct and meant only for our good. His words are reasonable, truthful, and consistent with scripture. Returning the Pandava's kingdom is surely the wisest course of action, looking across at Duryodhana and his brothers, Kripa said, but if we are not to follow this course, then we had best prepare for war. When those powerful heroes return, they will be burning with energy and ascetic power. Therefore, consider now how to expand your own forces. Seek out your allies and make treaties with them. Build a vast, unassailable army. If you deny the Pandavas their rights, then we face the gravest possible danger. Doryodhan was pensive Kripa was right. If he did not return the Pandava's kingdom, there would no doubt be a fight. But he had no intention of returning their kingdom. The fight was inevitable, unless they could be discovered first and sent back into exile. The Kaurava prince thought carefully. The report about Kichika had intrigued him. Apparently he had been slain by the five Gandharava husbands of a single woman. The coincidence with Draupadi and the Pandavas was almost incredible, especially because there were only a handful of men who could have killed Kichika in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Balorama, Shalaya, Karna, and Bhima. It could not have been the first three, because what reason would any of them have had for going to Virata and killing Kichika in secret? He had been beaten to a pulp in the dead of night. That sounded suspiciously like Bhima, and he would have had to do it in secret. It added up. Kichika had violated a woman with five husbands and had been slain in a manner that bore Bhima's unmistakable stamp. As Doryodhan pondered, Sasharma, king of the Trigartas, took advantage of the silence and said, O Korus, if you desire to expand your forces, you can begin by bringing Virata under your subjection. Now he is without Kichika and his followers should be little trouble. Let us go and take his wealth. Subjugating him, you shall increase both your treasury and your army by requisitioning his forces. I will bring my own army to assist you. Too many times have the Trigartas been overpowered by Kichika. Now we shall avenge ourselves on the Matsyas. Doryodhan felt that the gods, or perhaps the Danuvas, Habdi answered him. If he went to Virata, they might find the Pandavas. If they were not there, then there was no loss. He would still gain something by winning over that kingdom. The prince stood up and issued instructions. Sasharma has made an excellent suggestion. We should go to the Matsaya kingdom immediately. Prepare our army to leave at once. As he has suggested, Sasharma will accompany us with his own forces. Doryodhan ordered that they depart the next day. He told Sasharma to go ahead with his army and begin by taking away Virata's cattle. Doryodhan would follow with his forces and attack the city. As the other Karu elders sat in silence, Dhritarashtra gave his approval and preparations were begun after Kichika's death Viratna's citizens were afraid. Although Kichika had been cruel, he had also been powerful enough to protect them. Now they had no protector. How long would it be before some aggressive monarch tried to conquer them? The king, desperate to replace his commander, considered Kadanka, Vlabya, Tantripala and Granthika. It seemed to him that any of them could lead his army and protect the Matsyas. It was not long before Virata was presented with an opportunity to test his ideas. One morning as he sat in court, a cowherd ran and an exclaimed, The Trigartas are attacking us and stealing your cows, O king. Come quickly to rescue them, the king immediately issued orders for his army to assemble. He called for his armor and weapons and prepared to lead his army. His four sons surrounded him, also ready for battle. In a short time, hundreds of other powerful warrior chiefs assembled in the court. Outside the assembly hall, the vast Matsaya army lined the streets, ready to march. Chariots, elephants, horses and infantry created a clamor that resembled the ocean's roar. Virata's younger brother, Satanika, stood by the king's side. The king said, I have no doubt that Kadanka, Vlabya, Tantripala and Granthika will fight. Give them armor and chariots adorned with flags. I do not think such men, in doubt as they are with bodies like mountains and arms like elephants' trunks, will not join the battle." Virata strode anxiously out of his hall to organize his army, while Satanika had chariots fetched for the Pandavas. 
Having the four of them brought before him, Satanica presented them with armor and weapons and ordered them to fight. Enlivened by the thought of a battle, the Pandavas selected suitable armor and put it on. They mounted chariots and rode out of the city behind the king. The Matsaya monarch charged into battle on a massive chariot surrounded by his sons and the Pandavas. In his burnished armor, adorned with a hundred suns and a hundred eyes, the king shone like the sun encircled by the major planets. Behind them came a thousand infuriated elephants. Eight thousand chariot fighters and sixty thousand horsemen followed them, holding their weapons aloft and sending out terrible war cries. The entire army seemed like a mass of clouds charged with lightning moving across the earth. The Trigurtas were still rounding up Faratna's huge herd as the Matsaya army rushed upon them. Quickly abandoning the cows where they would not be harmed, the Trigurta warriors met the Matsaya's charge. A fierce battle ensued on the grazing grounds. As the enraged warriors slew one another, the battle resembled the one that had once taken place between the gods and the demons. A thick dust cloud rose up from the field, obscuring everything and screening the afternoon sun. Thick showers of arrows whistled through the air and warriors fell by the thousands. The screaming fighters hacked at one another with their swords and axes. As the blood of slain fighters flowed into the dust on the field, the clouds subsided. Heads adorned with helmets and earrings were rolling on the earth. Well-muscled arms, their gloved hands still clutching weapons, lay on the ground like serpents. Shattered chariots and pieces of armor were strewn everywhere. Vultures descended and tore at the bodies of the dead fighters. Jackals surrounded the battlefield. Sasharma, mounted on a gold chariot, came before Virata and bellowed out a challenge. He immediately released a hundred powerful arrows that struck the Ratna's armor and fell to the ground. Roaring like mad and bulls, the two kings circled one another with their weapons upraised. They discharged arrows like clouds pouring torrents of rain. Seeing him engaging with the Matsaya king, Sasharma's two brothers came to his assistance. With well-aimed arrows, they killed Virata's four horses and his charioteer. They then slew the warriors protecting his sides and rear. Sasharma leapt from his chariot with his sword held high and rushed toward Virata. With his two brothers, he seized Virata and took him captive. Yudhishthira saw Virata being led away on Sasharma's chariot. He quickly went over to Bhima and called out, The Matsaya king has been captured and his army routed. We have lived peacefully in his kingdom this last year and are indebted to the king Bhima, free Virata and thus repay our debt. We shall then put the Trigurtas to flight, Bhima's eyes glinted at the prospect of the fight. He had been awaiting Yudhishthira's command before engaging in the battle. So be it, he replied. Behold my prowess. I shall take hold of that huge tree over there like a mace and disperse the entire Trigurta army. Bhima moved toward a huge cell tree nearby, but Yudhishthira checked him. Oh child, do not be rash. If you uproot this tree and perform superhuman deeds, people will be amazed and say, surely this is Bhima take some other weapon so that people will not recognize you. Go on your chariot and the twins will protect your wheels. Release the king, Bhima urged on his charioteer and raced towards Sasharma, who was heading away with the captive king Nakula and Sahadev rode on either side and carved through the Trigurta forces. Approaching Sasharma, Bhima yelled, wait, turn and fight. Behold now a mighty feat of arms as I throw you down with all your followers, Bhima let go a steady stream of arrows and Sasharma turned to face him. When the Trigurta king saw the powerful Bhima and the twins before him, it seemed to him that Yamaraja, flanked by death and time, had come to do battle. Along with his sons and generals he tried to withstand the Pandava's attack, but hundreds were being killed. Chariots were smashed and elephants slain. Horses with their riders fell like trees blown over in a storm. The Pandava's forceful arrows swept in clouds through Sasharma's ranks and created havoc. Bhima leapt from his chariot and rushed about, whirling his mace, mowing the infantry down like a field of corn. Witnessing the devastation, Sasharma was astonished. It seemed that they would be annihilated by these three warriors. He pulled his bow back to his ear and sent long steel shafts at the roaring Pandava's Bhima struck the straight flying arrows with his mace and the twins struck at them with their swords. Encouraged by the Pandava's prowess, the remainder of Viratna's army rallied and charged back into the fight Yudhishthira rode into their midst, working a great bow. With sharpened arrows the eldest Pandava quickly dispatched a thousand Trigurta warriors to deaths of Bodhima, back on his chariot and fighting alongside his brother, killed seven thousand Nakula and Sehadev, 
focusing their efforts on protecting their elder brothers, slew a further thousand brave Trigger tough fighters. Sasharma began to retreat and Bhima went after him swiftly. He killed Sasharma's four horses and brought him to a halt. Seeing his opportunity, Virata grabbed a mace and leapt from the chariot. The old Matsaya king began fighting Sasharma's troops, wielding his mace and dancing about like a young man. Sasharma jumped from his chariot and raced away. Bhima called out to him, Stop! It is not becoming of heroes to fly away. With such prowess why did you think of stealing Virata's cows? Why are you now abandoning your followers? Sasharma, provoked, again turned to face Bhima. Stand and fight, he shouted, brandishing his iron club. Bhima leapt down and rushed toward the bellowing Sasharma as a lion attacks a deer. Not caring for Sasharma's blows, Bhima seized him by the hair and dashed him to the ground. Pulling him back up, he struck him several fierce blows. Sasharma fell gasping to the ground. Bhima placed his knee on his breast and dealt him powerful blows to the head. Sasharma lost consciousness and Bhima dragged him to his chariot. He took the insensible Trigger talking to Virata and said, Behold a sinful man, whom I have captured. Surely he does not deserve to live, the king replied, Release the wretch, Bhima dragged Sasharma to his feet and, as he returned to consciousness, snarled at him, Although I should slay you for stealing the cows, I will release you. According to Kshatriya custom, you are now Virata's slave. You must declare this wherever you go. Only if you agree to this condition will you be allowed to live. Go now and do not again perform such rash acts. Sasharma bent his head low and climbed down from the chariot. He bowed to Virata and left, taking with him the remnants of his army. The Matsayas cheered. They surrounded the Pandavas, still unaware of their identities, and praised them. Virata said, Today I have been saved by you four heroes. All this kingdom's wealth is as much yours as it is mine. I will bestow upon you richly adorned women and heaps of gems. Tell me why do you wish to have and it is yours. Indeed, become the rulers of my kingdom. What more can I say? Yudhishthira said humbly, O king, we are pleased with your words, but it is sufficient for us that you are freed from danger. Come, Virata said. I will install you as king of the Matsyas. How can I rule in your majestic presence? It is due to you alone that I am even able to see my kingdom and my relatives today, Yudhishthira held up his hands in deference. We are not able to rule Matsaya. Pray forgive us. O king, you should continue to rule this prosperous kingdom in peace and happiness. Send emissaries into the capital to announce your victory. In keeping with the custom of the victorious, we must spend this night on the battlefield, Virata turned to his ministers and ordered them to carry news of their victory to the city. Let damsels and courtesans, decked with ornaments and carrying musical instruments, come out of the city to entertain the troops, the king said delightedly. The ministers left at once and the warriors prepared to spend a night on the field.